Um, I'm Jeff Meyerson. I host a podcast called Software Engineering Daily. It's a daily podcast about technical software topics. And uh, my talk is called You Are Not a Commodity. Okay. okay it's, oh, I see. Um, so much for the clicker. Uh, a little bit about myself, I grew up playing poker. I played poker in high school and professionally in college. And I uh, went to University of Texas. I studied computer science. And um, after I studied computer science, I graduated and started working as a software engineer. Uh, I worked as a software engineer at a variety of different places, um, most recently uh, Amazon. and. Um, uh, after Amazon, I started a podcast called Software Engineering Daily, which is a daily podcast about a variety of software engineering topics. That's one of the reasons I'm excited about this conference is it really manifests the idea that we can study all of these different software engineering topics. Uh, and, and that's the idea of the, the full stack day, uh, as I understand it. And uh, since starting Software Engineering Daily, I've also started a variety of software companies. Uh, most recently, Find Collabs. Okay, so again, my talk is called You Are Not a Commodity. What is a commodity? A commodity is a raw material that can be bought and sold. You are not a commodity. So how did you become a commodity? Well, it started with the industrial age. We got this thing called the assembly line, and the assembly line turned the worker into a fungible commodity that was easily replaceable. And this led to great industrial development, but the downside is that the worker became a commodity. And we all know that this didn't work out so well for the worker, at least in the short term, uh, but we did get some great industrial services because of it. Now, this continued to the days of early programming, uh, and it made sense because Constructing early programmers required a gigantic team and everybody had to do something small and fungible because things went so slow and so painfully. Today, that may not make as much sense, but we still are viewing software as this assembly line, this Kanban board of slow, painful iteration. And we brand ourselves as commodities. We call ourselves I'm a senior Java developer. This is who I am. This is what I do. Just swap me in for any other senior Java developer. And we even aspire to be a commodity. We aspire to be a senior staff software engineer, or a principal engineer, or a fellow, or a senior fellow. One of these interchangeable titles. You are not a commodity. OK. so. Is this bad? Does this matter? Like, maybe we're doing this commodity engineering thing, but if we're still getting the benefits of the Industrial Revolution, who cares? Isn't this just fine? Well, this is what my nightmare was from the ages of 5 to 21. This is Zebo the Clown from Are You Afraid of the Dark? It's a American Nickelodeon series that they used to air for children. It's terrifying. I don't know why they showed this to children. But they did. And so this was my nightmare up until I was 21. When I turned 22, things changed. And I started using IntelliJ IDE to debug and step through code and uh, do all kinds of other commodity engineering tasks. And it became horrifying for me, because this was my reality. And it was so tedious. And I, I knew there had to be something different. So, when you're dealing with something that's really difficult and problematic, uh, you have to take a step back. You can't panic. Uh, this is Eisenhower. He's uh, one of my favorite grand strategists. Eisenhower knew that the Cold War was a problem, right? Like, the world might blow up. But he had no choice but to step back and golf sometimes, to let his brain relax and to sift through what are my options here. So, Similarly, if you are realizing that you are a commodity, you need to take a step back and think through, what are my strategic options? First of all, here's, here's the strategy of no strategy, which is to do nothing. And you will be corralled off a cliff like these buffalo 
that are becoming a commodity. The second strategy is to stay at the company and be what is called an entreployee. This is where you build something that provides immense value to the company and you get to receive a small fractional upside of that benefit. Um, you might invent the like button and create some small percentage of it. You might invent the hollow lens and, and get some small percentage of it. You might even become Andy Jassy and be CEO of Amazon Web Services. That's actually a pretty good outcome. So maybe this is like a viable strategy. Um, but it's not the one that's for me. Oops. OK, so another strategy is to build your own assembly line. Now, we are living in a time when you can do this. You don't have to work at the industrialist assembly line. You can build your own. Uh, and, and I'd like to talk through how and why to do that. OK, what does your assembly line look like? First of all, your assembly line should be niche. This is a great way to start because you are an individual. You have niche ideas. You have niche preferences. You have niche beliefs. You have a niche set of DNA and experiences. And so you should start with a niche. Amazon started with selling books on the internet. That is extremely well defined. Your assembly line should be fun. Why not? We've got so many different things we could be doing. Why not have fun while you're doing it? Your assembly line should compound. Anything that serves a reasonably large market, that market's going to grow, and it's going to compound. So uh, you should factor in compounding into whatever it is that you choose to build. And finally, your assembly line should have adjacencies, because why stop at whatever first assembly line you build? You should be able to expand to adjacent assembly lines to make your assembly line more efficient and to have it synergize with other things that you're building. OK, so we want to build an assembly line. Why not? What tools do we have to build that assembly line? The first tool, I'm biased, is podcasts. This is also useful for the strategizing section of uh, your career as a commodity. Um, I love podcasts so much. They allow me to learn passively. I can walk around, I can wash dishes, I can exercise, and I can learn through all of these things. You can listen to so many interesting conversations between people. Podcasts have made it so that you don't have to be forced to have conversations with the people around you. You get to opt into whatever conversations that you want to participate in and be a fly on the wall for. The next tool is courses. If you have an idea for what your assembly line should be, there is plenty of information about how to build that assembly line on the internet. I like Free Code Camp is a great place to start because it's free. Servers have become free, essentially free, or extremely low cost. This is as fundamental a change as the smartphone, but many people don't see it because it's, it's hidden from them. I mean, you know, if you're not a software engineer, you don't really understand how important the cloud is. Uh, but as I understand, I, I'm, I'm not super familiar with this, but I believe that servers in the 90s cost something like $50,000 if you wanted to, to, get to start, start a software company. So that's how transformative uh, it is today, that it's free and it used to be 50 grand. Open source is a tremendous opportunity and we should really recognize how important the open source tooling that we have today is. Kubernetes has made it simple to build distributed systems. And if you've studied distributed systems theory at all, you know distributed systems did not used to be simple. Uh, React has made the front end consolidate. We now have network effects in the front end with React components, and that is a tremendous accomplishment for the software engineering community. The gig economy is completely underestimated for how it changes the world of work. We all know that Uber and Lyft have made driving a commodity workforce uh, task, but um, knowledge work has been turned into a gig economy application as well. And the people that you can find on the gig economy for knowledge work, such as Fiverr, they are not commodities. They are individuals that with special talents. This is an album that I wrote uh, called The Gig Economy, and I wrote it with Fiverr musicians. So I found vocalists and drummers and guitarists on Fiverr, and they were spectacular. So uh, the gig economy is totally underestimated. Collaboration tools have formalized the way that we do work online. 
So we need less of a framework in terms of people that are managing other people. We have these collaboration tools that provide a schema for how to work with one another. SAS tools. The SAS tools that are available to you as an assembly line builder are better than what you will have in the enterprise. You don't have to deal with the enterprise crufty tools that you're going to be forced to use, the enterprise expense accounts. You don't even have to be locked into the unified Google Docs stack. You can choose things like Notion or Airtable or whatever modern SAS tools you want. And that makes for a better assembly line. Social networks. It's time that we move beyond the decades of social networking being just used for envy and um, malevolence. We can use social networks as tools to find each other, to build things, for inspiration. Uh, this is a screenshot from a social network that I'm building called Find Collabs. This is a place to find collaborators, to find co-founders, to find people who are serious about their work, and to build projects with those people. Low code, uh, I believe Wix is a sponsor of this conference. Wix has also been a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily, so thank you to Wix. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that they want to reach software engineers, you might not think of low code as a tool that a software engineer needs, but low code is just a higher level of abstraction. It's actually something that engineers should be super excited about and looking to leverage. Um, there's also medium code. Airtable essentially turns a spreadsheet into a high-performance computing tool. And this is another high level of abstraction that, uh, frankly, is a little intimidating for me. I don't even know how to evaluate the paradigm that we're in now, thanks to tools like Airtable and Wix. But we should probably all be moving higher up the stack and evaluating how to, how to utilize these new tools. Uh, and slightly lower in the stack than the Airtable or the low-code low tools of the world, we have Platform as a Service 2.0. We have things like Netlify. This is the next generation of Heroku-like tools, although I still love Heroku. Uh, we don't even necessarily need to be working with something as low-level as AWS or Google Cloud. We have a no-ops platform like Netlify. Uh, OK, so I've given you some stuff to think about. Now let's take a step back. How should companies operate? Because obviously, if you're trying to build an assembly line, that means you're trying to build what should be a company. And furthermore, if you are managing a company, if you operate a company, that means that your employees now have the option to go build their own assembly line. How do you develop a company that they're actually going to want to stay at? Uh, this is a, an album cover from an album that I wrote uh, around the time I was leaving Amazon. So uh, I, I wrote it. It's called the Blue Badge. Everybody at Amazon gets a blue badge to work with uh, to let you in and out of the building. I think Microsoft also has blue badges. And I think of a blue badge as the epitome of the employee status. Um, Amazon was extremely inspiring for me. But I had a vision for what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to write music. I wanted to record podcasts. I wanted to create software. And I did not find a path to allow myself to do that at Amazon. And I think that's something of a tragedy. So how should companies work? There is a book called The Alliance that was written by Reid Hoffman uh, and a couple co-authors. This book really transformed how I think about the relationship between a manager and an employee. It should be a long-term alliance. It should be durable beyond the life of, a company's em of a, a, an employee's employment at a particular company. Um, Alliances allow us to build durable relationships that are positive sum. I think companies should espouse a certain philosophy. They should de determine what do they stand for? What ideas do they stand for? There is something you can get at Amazon that money cannot buy, and that is exposure to the implementation and extension of Amazon's philosophy. You can get these 14 leadership principles on the internet. You can get them on your first day at Amazon. But seeing them at scale, seeing hundreds of thousands of people act in concert to implement these leadership principles is truly a thing of beauty. Companies should be independent. Greg just talked about this idea of the full cycle developer. Uh, that is an, an epitome of, of developers becoming independent and having their independence uh, encouraged. Facebook is also 
uh, known for being widely decentralized and encouraging the independence and the mobility of the employees. On Software Engineering Daily right now, we're doing a series about Facebook engineering, and it has just been an honor to interview these different Facebook engineers and, and get an understanding for uh, how this tremendous company was architected. Programmer anarchy is a term that was coined by Fred George. Fred George is an engineering leader. I don't remember the name of his company, but uh, they tried this thing where they removed all the managers in the company, and programmers were allowed to basically do everything. They did the design, they did the engineering, and they figured out what should be built. And it worked extremely well. There was cost cutting, uh, things moved faster, and, uh, and that's pretty cool. Now, it's worth noting that this was tried in the late 90s or the early 2000s. Google tried to do this. Larry Page said, let's remove all the engineers, and it didn't work at all. It was complete chaos. You had tons of engineers reporting to one senior engineering leader, and it was just a disaster. But today, we have Slack, we have GitHub, we have these beautiful collaboration tools that put in place a schema of how we should be working. Maybe we can just remove all the managers. I think companies should have at least 20% time. I think employees should be allowed to spend 20% of their time working on something that contributes to the company or maybe doesn't contribute to the company. Maybe it's art, maybe it's music, maybe it's writing their own software that they're going to build a company based off of. But the companies should encourage this. You should give your employees creative freedom because Nobody else is encouraging creative freedom. Even in everyday life, societally, we suppress creative freedom. I think companies should have an internal Y Combinator-like model. Uh, I think you know, Y Combinator essentially embodies this idea that uh, there are a lot of engineers, there are a lot of people who, who are capable of building companies, but they don't have access to the proper education, they don't have access to the proper resources to get started with their company. Well, if you're running a company, that means that you pro and the company's doing well, that probably means you've instituted a, a pretty high hiring bar. So if you have this high hiring bar for the employees that are coming in the door and they stick around with the company for a while, you should have a concerted model for how those employees can off-ramp. We spend all this time on the, on the on company onboarding. We should also spend a lot of time on the offboarding. If, if an employee is going to leave and they're an extremely talented employee, you as a company should probably invest in them. Finally, I think your company should be small because we have a lot better services than we used to have and these services give us tremendous leverage. Therefore, we need to keep a company small. We need to encourage the equity density to remain high. This is a picture of WhatsApp. We all know that uh, WhatsApp was a pretty good outcome for uh, all of the engineers there, uh, even though it was, it was quite a small company. Okay, so I'm talking about this transformation from uh, a world where you have to work for the major industrialist uh, to a world where you have the option to build your own assembly line. Okay, cool, so what can we build? What are the opportunities? This is you, you're staring at all those cool opportunities. This slide is, uh, is, is a really important uh, acknowledgement for me. Um, we are living in a time of a new economic boom. And um, you know, maybe you can map that onto the stock market that just seems to be going up and up and up and up. But despite that, uh, there is something fundamental going on. We have an increase in supply and demand for compute. On the supply side, we have Amazon Web Services and the other cloud providers. Cloud is completely transformative. And on the demand side, we have smartphones. L look at all of us. We're completely tied to our smartphone because it is essentially a magic wand in our hands. And that magic is only gated by the cloud. So we have this back and forth pull for more cloud, which creates a desire for more mobile, which creates a desire for more cloud, and this ever-expanding economic horizon. So it's, it's quite a tremendous time to be a software engineer. So who can we build for? Well, what about emerging markets? From this outdated graphic, you can see that much of the world remains offline, uh, largely. Uh, you know, offline, is, uh, offline versus online is obviously a gradient. But the more that these countries, the more that these locales come online, the more desire for niche internet services they're going to have. And why not build for these people? They're going to be just as economically empowered and intellectual as you and I. 
Uh, getting a little bit more concrete, machine learning is obviously going to be tied into every single thing that we do. Um, look, just look, you can just look around the room and think of all the opportunities for machine learning. We've got some, shan some chandeliers. I don't think those chandeliers have machine learning in them. Uh, we've probably got some smoke alarms in the room. I don't think those have machine learning baked into them yet. So that shows just, just how, um, how immature we are in terms of uh, how machi machine learning is basically the application of statistics to uh, everything in our world. Everything in our world emits statistics, so everything in our world should imbibe statistics and, uh, and improve over time. Manufacturing as a service has made it such that if you have a hardware device that you want to prototype, uh, or you have a shirt, you have a clothing line that you want to prototype, you want to build, you want to sell it, manufacturing as a service has made that cost efficient thanks to the wealth of conveyor belts that people have been building, these, the wealth of assembly lines that people have been building over the last X years. <clears throat> um, there's a term I've heard called the smartphone dividend. Uh, the smartphone dividend is the idea that um, because of the economies of scale of smartphones, we also got economies of scale of all the things that fit into a smartphone. So you have these sensors, accelerometers, and so on, these small things that you can fit together like Lego blocks, uh, these are now affordable, and, uh, and, and this, is, this is an opportunity to construct things out of these Lego blocks of hardware. Uh, it, gig economy niches are going to be a way that uh, much of the world uh, buys and, and, uh, and is represented as work. So uh, RigUp is, is a company that's a gig economy specifically for people in the energy market. I believe it's for uh, petroleum engineers and petroleum workers, people on oil rigs and stuff. That's kind of a niche market. Uh, a, another niche gig economy platform that I use personally is, is called G2i. It's a place where you can hire specifically React and React Native and GraphQL developers. React and React Native didn't even exist five or 10 years ago. Uh, so we're just going to see more and more of these gig economy niches, and I think that's an interesting place where you can uh, build. Uh, one interesting, uh, slightly technical area that I found uh, in, in the shows on Software Engineering Daily is this cloud resale business. So are there are these companies like Spotinst, which I believe is an Israeli company. There are companies like Netlify. Uh, there are other, other platform as a service providers and these higher level cloud provider things. These things have great margins, and if you have an opinion about how software development should exist, you can turn it into a platform as a service, and you've got a great business. Uh, most software companies are not capital constrained from, you know, from the early days at least, you know, just from the idea perspective. They're more uh, labor constrained. But if your idea is capital constrained, if you really need money, capital markets are really opening up. Uh, and there's a variety of software platforms you can use to get some money if you need money. Uh, now, I, I, I just want to emphasize that I'm not trying to just list a bunch of like exciting trends and show you that everything is just up and to the right and it's compounding in this uh, Kurzweilian graph. Uh, I'm just trying to say that there are, there's a palette of things. There's a palette of paints that you can choose to combine and, and mash together and find the synergies between. Uh, and, and I think if you're looking for an idea, you could do worse than to just evaluate all of these breathtaking technologies uh, and, and try to find some synergies between them, to try to find something to build. You are not a commodity. So what are you? You're an individual. As an individual, we should uh, figure out our education. We should start with audio. Audio lets us be educated in a passive fashion. We should figure out what kinds of businesses to build. Uh, Indie Hackers is a great place for inspiration on how to be an individual and build a business that manifests your creativity. We should find our individual edge. Uh, Kylie Jenner found enough of an edge in the makeup and social media marketing market to build a billion dollar business that is mostly just her, as far as I understand. Uh, and with Software Engineering Daily, I focused on specifically engineering and uh, software topics in podcasting. And that has been a pretty interesting uh, ride for me. Once you figure out what is your niche, you can expand your moat relentlessly. 
I have tried to do this with Software Engineering Daily. I've tried to improve the quality over time. Uh, if you listen to the show and you have any critiques for me, I want to know it because I'm going to factor that into my, my loss function and improve things. Uh, similarly, MailChimp, they're just a newsletter company. I think they have not raised any money, and I'm pretty sure they're a unicorn. They do newsletters. Like, they're really good at it. And they've just relentlessly expanded that moat, so I find them inspirational. Um, once you figure out what you're building and what your moat is, you can find adjacencies. Software Engineering Daily is a software engineering podcast, which sounds pretty niche. Uh, but it actually has a ton of adjacencies to expand to. Actually, it's good that it's a niche because it, it lets me discover uh, things that are slightly higher level. So we've started uh, Podsheets, which is a place where people can host their podcast. It's sort of like a, a WordPress. It's an ecosystem, an open source ecosystem for podcast hosts. Um, uh, I started a company called Adverprise. That's the little camera guy icon. Uh, Adverprise represents a uh, play against the, uh, the the current ad tech market that is uh, um, saturated with fraud and uh, and tasteless advertising. Uh, I started Software Daily, which is a, uh, a social network that is based on my Software Engineering Daily podcast. It's an open source platform. So uh, if you're if you're learning to code, you're looking for a cool open source project. Software Daily is a good place to start. Uh, and, and more recently, I started Find Collabs. Find Collabs is a platform to find collaborators and build projects. It's for people who are serious about their work and they want to create interesting projects and they want to do those with other people in the world. Uh, individual software creation, for me, has been the most satisfying artistic endeavor. Uh, and, and I really encourage you, uh, all of you who have not built an application end-to-end -end that you can show to other people to try this because um, building software that you can share with the world is, is like architecting your belief system about the world and mapping it onto a tool that other people can use. So uh, it, it's just inspiring to see something get manifested and turned into a utility that other people can consume. And I really encourage all of you to, to pursue that feeling. OK, some final conclusions. First of all, there are just some fundamental changes going on with our world. And we should really take a step back and question, what is going on here? And, and how are we working? And is this the right way to be working? We're not competing with each other. We are just trying to figure out how do we make it past this strange gap in time where we have all the technologies to, to really allow everybody on the planet to live a fulfilling life, and yet we don't have that reality yet. So we're not competing. We're trying to figure out how do we solve these problems uh, as a global community. Uh, this is a screenshot from a game called Pandemic. Pandemic is interesting because uh, in at least one of the modes of the game, you are not competing with the other people in the board game. You're all working together to prevent a global pandemic that destroys the population. Uh, and that's how we should see our lives. Finally, is it a smartphone or is it a magic wand? So you compare the smartphone to the magic wand of Harry Potter. The magic wand doesn't even have a user interface. It's just a stick of wood. Like, I think we've got something that's better than a magic wand. And it, things are actually getting better. We're getting rid of the smartphone. We're getting rid of the magic wand. All you need are AirPods. And you just utter incantations to the magical cloud, and the cloud fulfills your wishes. That's, like, that's magical. We are literally living in the Harry Potter world. So I just think it's, it's it's, it's worth taking a step back and really evaluating what is this world we're living in and what are we trying to do. You are not a commodity. Thank you. <laughs>